Hello lovely people! I'm back with another historical profile for those of you who just love learning about exciting deaf, disabled or LGBTQ plus folks from history. I mean, let's be honest, it's the history classes we all deserve to have in school. Today we're going to be talking about someone a little different to our previous characters. Whilst many of them are widely known, Annie Jump Cannon isn't spoken about as much as she really, really deserves to be. You can find my previous videos in the series in a playlist that will be linked in the description and probably in a card above, right? Remember, if you're new here or have been watching for a while but haven't yet done so, to please hit the subscribe button and then the notification bell to make sure you don't miss out on any of the wonderful people I shall be spotlighting in the future. And if you have a suggestion for my next profile, then please do leave it in the comments below. Born on the 11th of December, 1863, Annie Jump Cannon was the oldest of three daughters born to Wilson Cannon, a Delaware shipbuilder and senator, and his second wife, Mary Jump. Unusually for a middle-class Victorian mother, Mary Jump did not just train her daughters in music, manners and marrying. Oh, why thank you kindly, sir. Of course I'll marry you in return for that compliment. But instead, she encouraged her girls to follow their own passions. Annie's mother taught her the constellations and emboldened Annie in pursuing studies in mathematics, chemistry and biology. They would gaze at the stars together from an attic room using an old astronomy textbook to identify the beautiful shapes and patterns that could be seen with the naked eye. By her early teens, Annie had already memorised a working map of the night sky. Obviously, she did also have to learn household economics, don't be silly. It's not like she could Google things or watch a YouTube video on how to change a plug. She also didn't have plugs. Those early lessons in family economics, savings and labour supply actually kind of panned out wonderfully though when it came to her research later on. See, you think your mother is telling you how to load the washing machine and it's boring, but she's actually giving you vital study tips you'll need to pass your exams. Listen to your parents unless they are disparaging you, in which case, nah. Since Annie so clearly enjoyed school and learning new things, particularly in science, her parents decided to send her to university. Yeah! I know, we're all stunned by this excellent late 19th century parenting of a daughter. If only all 21st century parents around the world would catch up. Annie studied physics and astronomy at Wellesley, one of the top academic schools for women in the US. She studied under Sarah Frances Whiting, one of the few female physicists in the United States at the time, and went on to become the class valedictorian. She graduated with a degree in physics in 1884. And sometime during this time, she contracted scarlet fever, a contagious infection that, since the proper treatment was not wildly available at that time, had a high mortality rate and often left people with lifelong problems. Long-term complications as a result of scarlet fever include kidney disease, rheumatic heart disease and arthritis. It's generally seen in children aged 5 to 15 and was a leading cause of death for young people in the early 20th century. Annie was stricken with scarlet fever while at university and it caused an ear infection that left her close to profoundly deaf. So what did she do? Looked after her well-being for an appropriate period of time of convalescence and focused on recovering her strength before she felt completely well enough to return to school. And then she got right back up and came class valedictorian because she was a fighter. Focus on your own health and well-being first before pushing yourself into being someone else's inspirational story. She graduated in 1884 with a degree in physics and returned home, but grew restless with the limited career options available to women, because there were only three of them and they were all Dallas dishwasher. Her hearing loss also made it difficult to socialise, especially since she was a very lively and extroverted personality. <sighs> Hard to relate. Instead, she threw herself into a new love of photography and travelled through Europe taking photographs with her Blair Box camera, which, as you can tell from the name, was both a camera and a box. Most of the accounts I've read of Annie Jump Cannon make it sound as if nothing happened to her ten years after she graduated, but she actually did rather well with her photography, probably because she didn't have to listen to anyone. <laughs> After returning from her travels, her prose and photographs were published by the Blair Company in a pamphlet called In the Footsteps of Columbus and distributed as a souvenir at the Chicago World's Columbian Exhibition of 1893. Go Annie! But it's also fair to say that her hearing loss made daily life very difficult. Annie did not search for a husband and no one seems to have thought it was a consideration. 
I mean, whether that's from the innate ableism in the desexualization of disabled or chronically ill people, or simply because Anne just didn't want one herself, we can't know. Since she was a strong and independent lady with no need for a man whatsoever, we're, we're not really going to talk about it again because... When Annie's mother, who was her main translator, died in 1894, her home life became more difficult and she wrote to her former professor, Wellesley, Sarah Frances Whiting, to ask about job opportunities. Whiting hired her as a junior physics teacher at the college and encouraged her to take graduate courses there in physics and astronomy. In order to gain access to a better telescope, however, she enrolled at Radcliffe Women's College at Harvard, which was actually just set up near Harvard College for Harvard professors to repeat the lectures to young Radcliffe women because sexism. It did, however, give her access to the Harvard College Observatory, where she became a Harvard computer. The computers were an all-women team of astronomy analysts who worked for the Harvard Observatory director, Edward C. Pickering, to complete the Henry Draper catalog with the goal of mapping and defining every star in the sky to a photographic magnitude of nine. You don't need to know what that means to be impressed. The story goes that one day Pickering became so enraged with the poor performance of his male Harvard grad students that he swore even his maid could do a better job and thus hired her on the spot uh, only to find out she was actually a bona fide genius who was better than even him. Ha! Also, sexism. After that, he only hired women, reasoning that they were better at detailed work, which is a little sexist. But we'll smooth over it. They were, however, referred to by other members of the university as Pickering's Harem, which... Wow. This sign is getting more usage than I wanted it to. Annie quickly became a phenomenal astronomer, and when tasked with classifying stars based on a huge catalogue of astronomic spectrography, she quickly realised that the classification system they were using was woefully inadequate. So she made her own, yeah! obviously. Previously, all stars had been lumped into the categories of A, B, and C. But Annie came up with a classification system of... Watch me attempt to get this one right. O, B, A, F, G, K, M, R, N, S. Which has largely been remembered for years now with the mnemonic of O, oh, be a fine girl, kiss me right now, sweet. Sure. By 1910, Annie's system for organising and classifying stars based on their temperatures and spectral types had become the de facto standard and remains so to this day as the Harvard classification scheme. Because yes, she was just that great. At the peak of her career, she was able to classify three stars per minute. And not only that, she remembered all of them. When shown a photograph of a star or asked to pick up a, a plate with a specific star on, she instantly knew out of tens of thousands of plates, the exact star and its name. Annie and the other women at the observatory were criticized at first for being out of their place, i.e. not being housewives. At this time, women did not commonly rise beyond the level of assistant, and whilst they were paid far less than their male counterparts for doing the same job. But Annie dominated this field because of her tidiness and patience for the tedious work and even helped the men in the observatory gain their own popularity. She wrote books and articles to increase astronomy status and helped book up partnerships in the international astronomy community. As she grew in prestige, she became involved in the women's suffrage movement and worked as an ambassador for professional women everywhere. She gave talks at the World's Fair in Chicago and never retired, working seven days a week, generally of the criminally low rate of 25 cents an hour until she finally died from heart disease at 76 years of age. Over her lifetime, she catalogued over 350,000 stars, and some attribute her astronomical skill to her deafness. Annie herself said that the silence allowed her to concentrate more fully on her work. In later years, with the help of a powerful hearing aid, she was able to gain back her social life and held regular dinner parties at her lovely house, which she renamed Star Cottage. It's so cute, I can't. Near the end of her life, with World War II on the horizon, Annie summed up her worldview in one of her last interviews. In these days of great trouble and unrest, it's good to have something outside our own planet, something fine and distant and comforting to troubled minds. Let people look to the stars for comfort.
I hope you've enjoyed today's video. Please do share it with someone who needs a little break from stress and just to learn about a wonderful woman. Please also consider becoming a member of the Calgary Fozard Club, a behind the scenes group of lovely people who have access to a special extra monthly video and sign up goodie bag and soon a Discord server, which I will be setting up once I learn how. I know I look young, but really I'm just a 90 year old with a good skincare routine and a passion for hydration. See you in my next video.